So I had not thought about how overturning Roe would impact the 200,000 women who serve in the military, who because our large military bases are predominantly in the South, are now in states where they have no access to abortion services. So if you're stationed at Fort Hood in Texas, the closest clinic to you is 500 miles away in Wichita. And by the time you drive there and spend three nights in a hotel to accommodate the waiting periods and pay for gas and pay for meals and pay for the procedure, you're looking at $1,500 or more. And the average enlisted woman, junior enlisted woman, her take home pay for a month is just over $1,000. And it's not a small issue because the women who serve in the military are younger and they are um, more likely than their civilian counterparts to have unintended pregnancies. And they're more likely to have complications in their pregnancies. And they're more likely to have violence in their pregnancies. Fort Hood, according to the military recent study, is the most dangerous base for women. One in 12 women there report being sexually assaulted this last year. And then there's just the issue of health disparities in our country, right? That the southern states have poor health outcomes. So Texas has a maternal death rate higher than any other developed country. There are counties in Mississippi where the death rate is higher than places in sub-Saharan Africa. And then, of course, we know that women of color, black women, are 30% of the population in the military, just 15% of the overall female population. And they're three to four times more likely to die in childbirth same for their children. So part of what overturning Roe has done is kind of rip the veil back and show us like really clearly how the health care you get in this country is so dependent on where you live and who you are, right? The zip code. But that's not all that overturning Roe has done. It's also shown us this kind of remarkable, incredible, creative, just life-changing work that women are doing, especially women of color, especially especially now um, women who've been let out, out of, pushed out, and especially queer folks even more now. But in the 80s and 90s, at kind of the typical pro-choice conference that was probably largely led by white women, women of color in particular began to kind of caucus and to come together and say, the issue is not just choice, the issue is justice. This issue is just not, you know, um, row or not row. It's raising children in healthy environments. So they began to make these beautiful statements about what it would mean to really live as God's blessed people. And they started with this really gorgeous affirmation of the body that we're called, all of us, to value our bodies, right? And all of the shapes and sizes they come in. And we're called to understand we've got to teach our young this, right? That you're responsible for your body, your agency and your autonomy over it. And then they began to talk about not just the freedom to not bear children or the freedom to bear children, but what the justice world would look like, right? Where we can all raise our children in safe communities, where there's not guns on the streets and lead in the water and toxic dumps, you know, that our kids are playing at. And the Black Women's Health Imperative and Sister Song and these remarkable groups that have really been doing life-changing work for 30, 40 years, particularly across the South, kind of like, reaching deep down into the kind of history of, of women and pulling out midwifery and doulas and birth coaches and highlighting you know everything from birth control to breastfeeding and starting other groups, Black Mamas Matter, and then speaking at the United Nations. And it has just really shown a light on the remarkable, like you cannot walk a foot on this earth without bumping into somebody who's doing incredibly life-giving, restorative, replenishing, renewing work. And that's how it has always been. That's the story of our faith. That's the story of Noah. It's the story of Genesis. It's the story of every sacred piece of work. It's ruin, and then it's repair. It's rupture, and then it's restoration. And this has got to be, you know, one of the sweetest stories, right? If you think about how the whole story of our creation begins in Genesis 1, what does God see? That it's good, right? The light from the day and the heavens from the earth and the land. And over and over and over we hear that refrain, God saw and it was good. God saw and it was good over and over again. Then by Genesis 3, you've got, you know, the little problem in the Garden of Eden and then you've got Cain and Abel. And then by Genesis 6, 
the whole thing has just gone to pot. And God looks around, and what does God see? That it's all evil. And God, the scripture is like, I mean, when the Hebrew repeats itself over and over again, it's like, God looks around, God sees that humans are completely evil, God sees that the inclination in every human heart was continuously evil, all the time evil, and God is grieved in God's heart, God regrets that God made the whole dead gum thing, and God says, I'm going to blot the whole thing out. I'm going to send a bunch of water to dissolve all these creatures of dust. I'm going to destroy, I'm going to wipe out. And there's a real true crisis here, because it's not just that the earth is messed up, it's that God is done with us. God is finished, God has got God's passport, looking for a different country. I'm gonna to go to Portugal, I'm gonna to go to Ireland, I'm finished with these people, right? God, God has had it with us. And then what happens? God's heart softens. God sees Noah, God sees Noah, righteous Noah. Who knew Noah, righteous one? And so God decides instead, oh, I'm going to have Noah, Noah's wife, Noah's family, Noah's wife's sons. They're going to build this ark, and they're going to fill it with the animals, and then there's going to be this bow, because Noah is righteous. Now, the early rabbis read this, and they said, how is Noah righteous? Because Noah does nothing to show anything like righteousness. In fact, if you were going to choose two things to say about Noah, he appears to be lacking in curiosity and lacking in compassion. Because in three chapters, six through nine, what does Noah say? Nothing. Noah says nothing. Noah says nothing like, are you sure? And shouldn't we try to save some people? And what about the neighbors? And people are like, God, doesn't the guy have any compassion? I mean, the rabbis were like, he doesn't seem interested at all in anybody except for Noah's own family. And so the rabbis did what the rabbis always did. They wrote their own stories to kind of make Noah into a better guy, to kind of explain how he could be righteous. The word for that, of course, is midrash, right? It's the oral Torah. It's expanding it. So some of the midrash are like, well, maybe Noah kind of dilly-dally, didn't go straight into the ark, kind of tried to hesitate and pause so that, you know, the neighbors would get it together and come on. But most of the midrash about Noah are about how good Noah was to the animals. There's all these ancient texts about Noah and the animals, how Noah didn't sleep for 300 and something days while they were on the ark, the rain, and then waiting for because Noah was so concerned about the animals. Some elephants like to eat at two, some at three. The ostriches at four. And then Noah was concerned about the chameleon. The chameleon never ate anything until finally one day there was a pomegranate and a worm fell from it and the chameleon ate the pomegranate and worm. And from then on, I mean, very elaborate stories written by these rabbis trying to say, really, Noah was a righteous guy. But then there's Mrs. Noah. Mrs. Noah is unnamed, as is kind of like every other woman in the Bible. The kind of most common name for women in the Bible is what? Unnamed woman, right? And that hasn't really changed much until the last 50 years. An early Midrash gave Noah's wife the name Nama, which comes in Genesis 4. But then in 1974, Sandy Eisenberg Sasso was ordained as the second rabbi in this country. And she has written a lot of beautiful midrash about women. One of my favorite, there are a lot of her children's books now, Noah's Wife, The Story of Nama. It's a lovely, lovely midrash. And in this, she talks about how, as Noah brought the animals on the ark two by two, Nama brought all the plants on two by two. That she went all over the earth to some of these beautiful pictures of her kind of gathering up. She first gathered up the spores that would go with the moss, and then she sh had a mighty wind, shake the redwoods, and got the cones, and then there were the maples, and then there were the pecans and the pistachios, and then there were all the flowers from the buttercups to the sunflowers, from the azaleas to the zinnias, and then all the lemons and the lima beans and okra and tomatoes and all of this, and she gathered them up in her beautiful, beautiful apron. It's this fanciful story, right? Noah's Ark, a fanciful story. And she brings them onto the ark, and she cares for them very carefully and begins to plant them. And then when the earth finally is restored, when the waters subside and they open the ark and the animals go out, then Nama comes out, and she begins to plant, and all of this spreads out across the face of the earth. And now we have this beautiful creation. That's the function of Midrash. It kind of takes the story and it asks us, what does righteousness look like now? 
And it's often based kind of in many ways in kind of other traditional stories or for women based in this truth that women across traditions have historically been the gatherers, right? And women have also been the healers and women also taken plants and used plants for restorative purposes. And you see that throughout the scripture, throughout the sacred story, throughout the Judeo-Christian tradition. People like Hildegard, you know Hildegard, she was that famous mystic, that saint from the 11th century. She's a composer in Germany and a nun, and she was a philosopher and mystic, and she was one of the preeminent healers. Hildegard lived to be 80-something, and she wrote two very large medical journals in which she had healings and cures for something like 400 ailments using 175 plants, including 12 plants that she used, this Catholic saint, for abortion. And that's not unusual. Fifth through the eighth century, Irish texts of saints, all kinds of curative answers for plants for ailments particular to women. Women as healers, women as restorers, women as these kind of agents of life, right? And the stories continue and they spread out. And even though things change, we're still called to that same amazing righteousness. I think about one of my heroes. She's a doctor named Meg Autry. Some of you may have seen her through the years. She started off as an army physician, and then she spent the, the bulk of her career teaching, teaching other people how to be OBGYNs, as well as her own practice at University of California, San Francisco. And she's been one of the women who's been shining a light on the truth that some of the disparities we have in health outcomes, particularly between black and white women in gynecology, come from the birth of the whole movement, right? You remember Marion Sims, he was the father of gynecology, and his statue that stood for 125 years in Central Park got taken down four years ago because why? He did so much of his experimentation on slave women without anesthesia, even though he used anesthesia for his white patients. One woman he conducted like over 30 experiments on. And so some of that understanding is that where we are as a culture comes from kind of the way we treated one another. And so Dr. Autry has been one of those women out there on the front talking about all the different ways we need to manage, kind of repair, and restore this earth so that we can begin to be in a world where everybody can have children who can flourish, right? And she's the woman you may have seen her recently who's building an ark off the coast of Texas, the Gulf, the ship that she's putting there where women from Fort Hood and women from the southern states can come to receive birth control and cancer screenings and abortion services. She's just got $20 million to raise and they're well on their way because they've been at it for a while. And what she said in her statement and in her interview was, there are so many amazing people doing creative, innovative things right now. I am determined to be among them, right? And so should we, right? And I have to tell you honestly, if there is a word I would use for myself, the word is privileged because every day I get to sit with you all and I get to hear your lives and I get to hear how you're caring for the people in your arcs. And it's just really incredibly remarkable the way people care for their little ones, their grandkids, the way they care for people beyond them. When I went to the Twin Cities two week, a week and a half ago, I sat with six households, you know, and the stories, you know, what I heard over and over again was how much people are using their lives to care and to repair. We talked about the loss of family some long ago, some more recent, the struggle with parents who are crippled with addiction and mental illness. We talked about our own struggles with our own young adults and our own households who struggle with the same. We talked about how to care for one another. We talked about loving our lovers, our partners, our spouses. And we talked about how we reach out. Our own Maddie Pakin Little is up there right now on her mobile clinic vet as a veterinarian doing spaying and neutering and with her not-for-profit on native reservations around Minnesota. I mean, it's just such a wonderful thing to hear her talk about trying to operate on the rabbit, which is not her thing, right? But trying to be respectful and learning and all of that. And then, of course, there was our own Tracy Revois. I can see Tracy up there. I stayed with Tracy in Paris, and many of you know that they're both veterinarians. But Tracy is raising and releasing modern butterflies. And this is the kind of thing that even somebody like me, who has not taken science or math since fourth grade, can do. 
So while I was there, I got to see the setup, which was pretty cool. She planted one milkweed to begin with. Now she's got a dozen milkweed. And in the summer months, she goes out there and she looks for the little eggs. She looks for the little bitty caterpillar. You know, you can look on the milkweed leaf for where there's been something eating it. And that's a clue that there's a caterpillar there. And then she takes the little caterpillar and she puts it in a Tupperware container with a little lead paper towel and a couple of milkweed leaves. And every couple of days she has to change it because they're voracious eaters and poopers, as she said. And the little caterpillar is in the caterpillar stage for 10 days, and then it goes into the chrysalis, and then it hangs upside down. And then after that, the little butterfly emerges and his body fills with fluid for three or four hours. And then, then Tracy puts the butterfly, takes it out, and puts it on her finger and releases it. She's already released three, and she's got four more coming. The very next day, when I got home, I heard the news that the monarch was on the endangered list. But we can do something about that, right? We can do something about that. It's like plant some milkweed, right? Raise some butterflies, release them. The hope in this story, of course, is that at the very end, God puts that rainbow in the sky. It's a covenant. It's a sign that for all our trouble, for all the fact that so many of our inclinations are broken and hurting, God is not done with us. God won't give up on us. God will be with us forever, right? God is going to help us find a way. And all we have to do is step up, reach out, reach deep, and try to be the amazing, creative, loving people God has called us to be. Amen. Amen.